Now that we've had time to discuss the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, as well as the overall characteristics of living things in general, we want to turn our attention to what makes living organisms different. What is the diversity of organisms? And this is for IB section A3.1. On our planet, there is a wide diversity of living organisms. The National Wildlife Federation estimates that there are three to 100 million different species that live on the planet, which is really just astounding, regardless of where we're actually at in that scale. New species are being discovered all the time, and unfortunately, species are also going extinct all of the time. That variation of life is essential to our existence on the planet and to life's existence on the planet, uh, both within differences between species and differences among different species. Um, and, and there's a wide variety of, of different types of species on the planet, as we see in some of these pictures here. Genetic variation or differences within uh, species and amongst different species is really essential to the survival of life and particularly the survival of um, life through natural selection. And so in this video, we're going to be examining how are those differences, um, what are those differences in, in our variation of life? So today, all species have a scientific name and as humans, we really like to categorize things. And so uh, in the 17th century, this began to become a trend where species that were discovered began to be named. And without some organization, uh, there wasn't consistency in, in how different species were named. And so in the 18th century, Carl Linnaeus is the uh, primary scientist that began to uh, establish a naming system. Uh, and he used the morphology of an organism, the internal and the external structures, to help describe an organism as a species. And then species are groups that have, or had at the time, similar traits. Today we use uh, and can use DNA sequencing to be able to distinguish one species from another, but at the time it was primarily based off of internal and external structures. Uh, and so Carl Linnaeus developed what we now know as the binomial nomenclature in which species have two specific names. And species are divided um, uh, through a categorizing system with the most broad being the domain, and then becoming more and more specific as we see in our upside down triangle, where we start with domain and then progress to kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and then species. And as we move down that list, the similarities between group, um, species within those groups becomes more and more specific. And so how a species is named, it consists of two parts. Typically it's of Latin origins, the first word in a species name is always capital, and it designates the species genus. The second word in a species name is always lowercase, and this is the actual species names. And so for humans, it would be Homo sapiens, where Homo is the genus, and sapiens would then be the species. Uh, both of these words are always written in italics if it's typed out, or if it's handwritten, it would be underlined. And when we're using this in a text, after the first use um, or, or, or writing of, of the species name, it can br be abbreviated so that it's just the initial letter of the genus and then the, the species name, so H sapiens for Homo sapiens. And so this is now how we name species so that there is some consistency and it's used worldwide by all scientists so scientists in different parts of the world can refer to the same species and be clear about what they're actually talking about. So our next question then is what defines or makes a species? And a biolog biological species is referred to uh, as the biological species concept, where this concept is the idea that a species is an unchanging group of organisms with differences, both internal and external, from other species. And as we'll get into a little bit later on in the course, species do change. We, we know this through natural selection because of changing environments. Um, and, but at any one point in time, we can still apply this as an unchanging group uh, of species in which the species, uh, the organisms within that species are all capable of breeding and have surviving reproducing offspring. And that really is the defining feature of what makes a species is the ability to reproduce and have surviving and fertile offspring so that they can actually reproduce. Uh, species also share a gene pool, and this concept, this idea, works well for most species, but not for all. Uh, sometimes it's possible that species can intermix and uh, produce offspring. Uh, probably a most common example of this would be a mule, uh, which maybe you're familiar with, a cross of a horse and a donkey produces a, a mule, uh, a living organism. Is it a species? It's kind of an interesting question. Um, scientists would generally say no, 
Uh, it's not its own species because that mule is sterile. It's not able to reproduce. And uh, a little bit more fun example would be a liger, which cross between a lion and a tiger. And additionally, the liger generally most often are also sterile. Uh, and so these hybrids, a mule or a liger, while they do exist as organisms, it doesn't really fit this uh, biological species concept idea in that an offspring is produced, but they're not fertile, so they're not able to reproduce and have their own offspring that are fertile. And so these hybrids, which also occur in plants, the genus Allium contains hundreds of species, onion and garlic, in which the hybrids do exist in natural habitats. Uh, and so sometimes, most times, this concept of, of what makes a biological species is applicable to most species, but not always because of these hybrids. Uh, we don't see ligers running around in the wild because the lion and the tiger habitat don't overlap. Mules we see in captivity, uh, as well as ligers uh, primarily in zoos. And so the idea of what makes a species fits for most, but not for everything. And it kind of goes back to this idea that there's always kind of some exceptions within biology uh, concepts or, or rules. Then based on this idea of a biological species concept, it is challenging to distinguish populations and species from one another. Uh, what makes a population is a group of organisms of the same species in the same area at the same time. And regardless of distance, if groups are genetically similar, if we look at their DNA and they're genetically similar, they are the same species. But separated species can diverge over time. And this is because the environments that they're in may be different. And this can cause a group of organisms, a population within an area to, to change over time through natural selection. And they may develop differences. Uh, this would be a gradual process. And so it, it makes it difficult to determine whether populations are distinct species or if they are the same species, and then what, how much of a difference must be present in order to distinguish different species. And so this makes defining species difficult, uh, and, and it's a, a challenge. And it's easier now that we're able to examine DNA evidence to, to help make some of those decisions. A good example of this we can see with lions. Throughout Africa, there are different lion populations spread throughout the continent. They're the same species, Panthera leo, but they can experience uh, gradual changes due to the specific environmental conditions of where they're at. And so those in Eastern Africa might experience some um, much different environmental conditions though, than those that would be in South Africa or Western Africa. And so that makes it difficult to distinguish, are they different species or are they the same species with slight variations in their DNA? And the general consensus would be that they are all of the same species currently on, the, on, on Africa. We have previously discussed how DNA is essential for the development of organisms and is responsible for all the characteristics of an individual organism and as uh, for species for that matter. DNA typically is uh, found within the nucleus for eukaryotic cell, uh, organisms and is contained within the nucleus and is long wispy strand uh, that's difficult to organize. As that cell begins to prepare for duplicating, uh, for dividing through mitosis, the DNA condenses down into chromosomes. And we can look at chromosomes uh, and compare between different species. And when we do so, we see that each species typically, um, not typically, does have a different number of chromosomes. Um, and it's, it's possible that those number of chromosomes can change uh, throughout the ex existence of the species, though that would occur over very long peri time periods and is not very common. Most plant and animal species have an even number of chromosomes due to sexual reproduction, where half of the chromosomes are received from each parent. And so humans, for example, we have a total of 46 chromosomes in which we receive 23 from mom and 23 from dad combined to produce 46. Uh, these uh, sex cells, these gametes, each have half, so sperm and egg each have those 23, and those cells are referred to or called haploid cells because they have half the number of chromosomes. A body cell, uh, like a skin cell or a muscle cell, would then have a diploid or two sets of chromosomes, and that would be the total of 46. Our nearest closest relative uh, in terms of chromosomes and, and similarities in DNA uh, are the chimpanzees, and chimpanzees have 48 chromosomes. The differences between these two species is only about 2% of the DNA. It's not very much at all. And the difference in chromosome numbers uh, is actually most likely from the combining of chromosomes uh, in humans. So we have two less than what chimpanzees do.
having more chromosomes does not necessarily indicate a greater complexity of that species. Um, but plants actually are, are the, the types of species that have the most number of chromosomes uh, because they can tolerate mutations that result in duplicate or extra chromosomes. Uh, humans and other mammalian species are not able to tolerate that as much. Typically the, the developing zygote, the fetus, would not go on to develop because uh, of too many or, or unmatching chromosomes. So we're not able to tolerate that. Plants can tolerate that more often. Um, and this is, this is most important in that all members of the species have the same number of chromosomes. It's really important that members of the species have the same number of chromosomes in order for that species to be able to persist. So as we just discussed, chromosomes appear during cell division, uh, specifically during prophase of mitosis. And we can view these by staining the cells and viewing under a microscope, uh, having those cells uh, burst so that the, the chromosomes are not overlapping allows us to actually be able to take a look at them. And how we do that uh, after we've taken the chromosomes and organized them is uh, called a karyotype, and this is a karyotype here. Staining of the DNA, this is not natural colors, but staining of the, of the different chromosomes uh, allows for banding, uh, banding patterns to, to be present for each chromosome. They also vary in size, and then the position of the centromere, which holds the two arms together, the chromatids together, uh, this position varies. And so this allows us to line up the similar chromosomes, one from mom, one from dad, uh, and we can take a look at the chromosomes for a particular species and make comparisons within the species or of different species. And this karyotype is uh, of humans because we can see there's one through 22, the autosomal uh, chromosomes, and then we also have uh, sex chromosomes, X and Y in this case. To better understand the similarities and differences between genome sequences of different species and within species, we need to look at the unity, unity and diversity. A genome is all of the DNA, the genetic information of an individual, and that's what makes up the genome. Members of a species have the same DNA with the same genes, uh, not necessarily the same type of forms, and in the same sequence. So to be a member of the species, you're going to have the same number of chromosomes. Those chromosomes will have the same genes. Uh, the sequence might be slightly changed, and we'll talk about that in a moment. During the process of meiosis, uh, which is the production of sex cells, sperm and egg, an exchange of portions of chromosomes can actually swap places. And this process is called crossing over. It takes place during prophase one of meiosis. We'll learn about it a little bit later on in the course. And it actually leads to genetic diversity. It's essentially just a way to mix up the combination of uh, types of genes. And this is possible because members of the species have the same number of chromosomes and genes. And so that's a, a unity. That's unity in that the species have the same number of chromosomes. We see diversity then expressed in the actual genes. And so within a gene sequence, uh, a gene is a section of DNA that's responsible for coding for some proteins, has the instructions to be able to make some proteins. We'll talk about that process later on. Uh, there can be different types. A very simple example, uh, the ability to uh, bend your thumb uh, it's called a hitchhiker's thumb. Uh, you can bend it back. Uh, I can't really bend mine back. Um, but that ability is controlled by a single gene. And what makes that ability present or not present is by the difference of a single nucleotide, uh, an A, T, G, or C. Having that or not having that, that's a different form or a different type. Uh, and so what we call a different form or an alternate form of a gene uh, is an allele. Um, and another example, this is very much simplifying it, but if we look at the trait of eye colors, uh, that's the particular trait that we're looking at. There are different, obviously there's different types or colors of eye colors. And so blue, uh, brown, green, uh, hazel, those would all be different types of eye colors. And those would all be different alleles for the, the trait of eye color. Eye color is actually a polygenic trait, which means it has multiple genes that control it. So it's actually much more complex, but that's just a simple explanation. Uh, to demonstrate what is an allele. Differences are usually only a small number of bases. So what makes each allele different from one another is just a small number of bases. So that difference could be as simple as instead of having a cytosine in one particular section of the gene, it might be a thymine uh, or an adenine. And, and the simple changing or exchanging of just one uh, nucleotide can make a difference uh, and, and result in a different form of that gene, a different allele. Positions in the gene where more than one base may be present are called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs uh, for short. Thousands of human genome sequences indicate that there's about 100 million different SNPs 
uh, but most of the three billion uh, are the same. There's unity uh, amongst our species. Uh, and per human, there's about four to 5,000 SNPs or one base in every 650,000. And this is a cause of diversity within the species. While this one base in every 650,000 may not seem like a great difference uh, that would lead to a lot of variation, this is actually one of the main uh, factors that contributes to variation within the human species. Not surprisingly, there is a wide diversity in the genome of eukaryotic species and all living species on the planet. There's a far greater amount of diversity or variation between different species than there is within members of the same species. And the, in terms of the variation in genome size, uh, how big the genome is or how much DNA there is, is based on the number of base pairs or individual nucleotides. And so large, it's actually possible for large genomes to have lots of non-functional DNA, meaning that they don't result or um, are used for the production of proteins. And within humans, this is actually about half of our genome. Uh, they're called transposons or transposable sequences of DNA, and they don't have a known function. We're not entirely sure what, what their purpose is. Uh, in the past, or oftentimes they're referred to as junk DNA, there is some evidence that maybe what we thought was junk DNA is not necessarily true. In a nutshell, we don't exactly know how DNA is used for all mechanisms of life and, and controlling life, and we're still learning much um, as time goes on and technology improves. Within the variation sequence uh, and comparing the base sequence of different species, over time, two populations can acquire more and more genome bases, and they can become more distinct in, in species uh, as they diverge from a common ancestor. Uh, and although changes are not common, uh, particularly Changes are not always common, uh, particularly in genes that have a vital function. Um, and this is because it provides a selective advantage uh, or disadvantage, um, and it results in not changing uh, and having, um, having the genes stay the same between very different species. And we see this sometimes uh, in, in vital genes, such as uh, the cytochrome C. Uh, it's a mitochondrial protein, and it's used during respiration to maintain ATP production. Our cells need ATP, which is uh, cellular energy, to be able to, to carry out their functions. And so living organisms ha have to have that ATP, and the gene that helps to make that happen is very, very similar uh, between lots of different species and, and very different species. And that's what's being displayed in the chart here. We can compare humans to other species, and we see that that gene and the amino acids that are used to make the proteins from that gene are really, really similar. Different species have different numbers and, and types of genes, and genes can be added or removed um, uh, as species diverge from a common ancestor. And so we, we typically see them to progress slowly as they adapt to different ways of life in terms of their genome diversity. The ability to compare organisms and to classify organisms for that matter has really improved drastically just within the last decade. Uh, and this is all based off of sequencing the entire genome of an organism, looking at the entire base sequence of an organism. Uh, this was first completed in the 90s with bacteria and archaea. Now it's possible with pretty much all organisms as long as the DNA can be extracted and collected. For humans, it was first completed in about 2003 with about 3 million base pairs sequenced. Uh, the speed and the cost is what's amazingly uh, how quickly it's changed and improved. In 2001, uh, it was about $100 million to sequence a human's genome. Today, it's about, or in 2020, uh, it's about $1,000. And so that is a massive difference in cost and opens up whole new applications to be able to compare species and really learn and investigate about the evolutionary origins uh, of different species. We can identify relationships between species. We can trace common ancestors. Uh, we can learn how to fight infectious diseases. One of the reasons that uh, the vaccines for COVID were produced so quickly was the ability to extract, sequence, and examine the DNA uh, between the different variants. According to science, there's about 30 million people that have had their genomes sequenced. And for humans particularly, this provides information and data about human migration, genetic diseases, human health. Uh, and it opens up all kinds of new doors for potential personalized medicine in the future. And this is already starting to, to be more and more common, uh, having genomes sequenced to be able to provide more directed medical applications and techniques. The, uh, the process of genome sequencing is just going to open up and make available all kinds of uh, new technologies and capabilities that we have not had in the past.
As we mentioned at the beginning of the video, the concept of, of biological species works for many species, but not for all. And so now let's discuss some of the, the challenges with that. Uh, within sexual reproduction, uh, it, it, it ensures that there's a mixture of genes and uh, ensures that there's a unity in terms of the number of chromosomes within a species. Uh, and this is regardless uh, if the species can reproduce both sexually and asexually. Sometimes some species have the ability to do both. In asexual reproducing species, however, offsprings are clones of parents that are produced uh, via mitosis. And, and a good example of this would be like blackberries and dandelions. If you've ever seen a blackberry before, it has this little arm that shoots out. And once that hits dirt, it, it starts a new plant. You could cut the, the arm between the two, and then you have two distinct plants. But they're clones of one another, they're identical. And so um, it, it's essentially making copies like in a copy machine. If the clones don't interbreed with other clones, then they're technically a separate species by that biological species concept. And so blackberries have hundreds of clones, uh, dandelions quickly have, have hundreds of clones also. And so it's difficult to apply the idea of the concept of species to these particular types of organisms. Another example would be the horizontal gene transfer that can occur between bacteria. Um, this would be where parents to offspring uh, is typically a vertical transfer. Uh, the parent uh, provides genetic information to the offspring. Uh, horizontal gene transfer would be from one organism to another, not necessarily parent to offspring. And this is common among bacteria. There is so much gene transfer that can occur uh, the, the species concept may not even apply to prokaryotes, uh, and it's far less frequent in eukaryotes. And so how this works is the, the bacteria, uh, one in our picture, transfers a gene uh, signified by red to the other bacteria, number two, and this is transformation. Uh, and so they're sending, uh, exchanging genes between one another, uh, not from parent to offspring, but just between two different individuals. And so this also makes it really difficult to distinguish, is, are, are these different species or are they one species? And so again, not everything exactly fits this concept of biological species. Members of the same species typically have the same number of chromosomes. Uh, and, and that number is oftentimes different than other species. In or for sexual reproduction, male and female produce gamete cells that have the same number of chromosomes. And these gametes are formed by the process of meiosis. In diploid cells, so like a body cell, there's two sets of chromosomes, one from mom, one from dad. And each chromosome carries the same sequence of genes. Uh, they may have different uh, forms of those genes, alleles. And those chromosomes that carry the same genes we call homologous chromosomes because they have the same genes, although those genes might be slightly different types. During meiosis, those homologous chromosomes pair up to ensure an equal separation to each gamete cell. And this helps to um, uh, ensure that uh, each gamete cell has, for humans, chromosomes 1 through 23 uh, in each one of those different cells. And then when those gamete cells, sperm and egg, fuse, the chromosomes then uh, match up and it produces a zygote. Uh, if the cells uh, or the gametes have different number of chromosomes, uh, this usually results in some unpaired chromosomes and oftentimes this would result in non-viable cells so the zygote doesn't even develop. Uh, at best, typically, the, the offspring would be infertile and unfortunately, this is how we see some of our genetic disorders uh, occur in humans. For example, Down syndrome is uh, an individual that has an extra of chromosome 21. So they have three chromosomes uh, for 21 rather than the typical two. And there are other diseases that are also uh, possible because of, of extra or deleted chromosomes. Usually though, the, the cells will not be viable. And so within species, the chromosome number should be the same uh, for, the, for the offspring to be fertile and to be viable. Uh, between different species, the chromosome numbers are going to differ. So for this learning objective, students are expected to produce a dichotomous key for a local plant animal. Uh, if you're one of my students in class, we'll actually do this together. Uh, if you're not and you're learning from somewhere else, we recommend that you spend some time researching how to make a dichotomous key. There are some general steps outlined here and then actually go about creating one for yourself and having some practice and familiar, familiarity using a dichotomous key because you may be expected to do so on the exam.
As I discussed just a minute ago, the ability to sequence DNA has really opened up all kinds of new doors uh, and applications for science. And here is one of those applications, what we call DNA barcoding. And this is a tool used to identify unknown species from uh, small samples of DNA. DNA samples can be taken from water, soil, basically any part of the abiotic environment. Uh, and, and the locations will contain DNA from individuals interacting with that environment. And so we leave DNA around on a regular basis, as do other species. Those species can be compared by looking at different gene regions to be able to identify uh, the organism groups or that particular species. And most common for animals and some protos is use, the use of cytochrome C oxidase uh, or the COX-1 gene, and it's found in mitochondrial DNA. That gene can be used to identify an unknown species. Um, there's large amounts of possibilities uh, for the use of this, this technique. Forensic science, um, uh, identifying uh, individuals, uh, uh, suspects, uh, food safety, ecological assessments, uh, species identification, invasive, invasive species detection. It, it has a wide range of different uses and applications. Uh, and so it's a really cool tool that scientists and biologists have now to be able to uh, compare sequences and identify unknown organisms.